Okay, so here we go. So we're delighted that you could join us tonight for our webinar on urban tree canopy cover mapping. Um, so my name's Adam, I work for a UK woodland conservation charity called the Woodland Trust. So we're the UK's biggest woodland conservation charity, care for about a thousand woods of all shapes and sizes. We advise thousands of landowners and farmers and community groups on tree planting schemes, keep a register of the UK's oldest trees and Increasingly, we're trying to do more for trees in urban areas too, and that's something we're going to be looking at quite a lot tonight. So tonight's webinar is all about how to use an online tool called iTree Canopy to understand more about the tree canopy cover levels in your area. So I'm going to be joined by two experts who are going to guide you through this. Um, Danny Hill from the Social Enterprise Tree Economics and Dr. Kieran Doik from the Government Scientific Experts on Woods and Trees Forest Research. So we'll firstly hear from Danny, who will talk us through the iTree Canopy system, and then we'll hear from Kieran and Forest Researcher running a project to build a UK canopy cover map, particularly focusing on urban areas, uh, building up council ward by council ward. So Kieran will talk about that um, and let you know how you can get involved with that. So just before I pass to Danny, um, a bit of housekeeping. So we've got the Q&A there for any questions. Um, do sort of add them in as we go and we'll try and cover as many as we can at the end. Um, if we don't have time to get to your question we will try and answer it by email afterwards. Um, that's something we've tried to do with other webinars. Um, we'll finish by eight o'clock um, and we are recording this and we will be sending you an email link to the recording if not tomorrow probably the day after or the day after that but soon. So delighted you could join us. I'm going to hand over to Danny from Tree Economics now who will give you an intro to the iTree Canopy system. Thanks, Danny. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me to come along. I'm just gonna first of all set my screen share up. So, um, da, da, da. one second. Okay, just to check before I start, is that all come up okay on the screen? Um, give me a shout if there's any problems. It's fine, Danny. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, so yes, good evening everyone. It's really lovely to meet you and um, I'm going to be taking you through sort of a tutorial or a, a how-to section of this webinar. Um, you're very welcome to do your own sort of practice project at the same time if you'd like to follow along. Um, I think they're going to pop the link in the chat so um, by all means if it's helpful just to sort of navigate around the website um, go for it but it is being recorded so please don't worry um, if you decide just to listen in on this one. Um, I also just wanted to mention two things regarding the tutorial so number one um, on the screenshots that I'm going to show sometimes the text can be quite small and I just wanted to make it really clear that there's no text on any of the slides that you need to read um, I'll be talking through everything the reason why I've included the whole portion of the screen is so that you can see where the buttons are that I'm talking about. So just to reassure you, don't to read anything, Just it's just for navigation purposes. Um, and also that some of those really zoomed images are um, a little bit blurry. Um, I don't think there's a way around it, unfortunately. It's just the resolution of the, of the background mapping and the little yellow cross that we do the point on is so tiny when you kind of put it on a slide. So on your screens, it'll be a lot more easy to see and uh, just let you know that 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 is just the resolution of the map behind I've zoomed quite close in to some of those points so just wanted to say that at the beginning but yes it's it's really lovely to meet you all um as I say my name is Danny and I am a senior consultant at Tree Economics and I've been working with Tree Economics for about well almost three years now um, I specialise in projects which involve uh, community engagement and primarily lead our town and city iTree Eco projects um, and in relation to the webinar today I led the uh, development and adaptation of iTree Canopy for the UK and Sweden so it's really really lovely today to be here and actually be demonstrating how to use the tool so it's really fantastic and thank you so much for, uh, for joining us so um, just for a little bit of background on tree economics and the iTree Canopy tool. Um, so our organisation is a social enterprise based at Exeter Science Park in Devon. Um, our company specialises in valuing the ecosystem services or tree benefits uh, that trees in our towns and cities provide. Um, it's our mission to work with communities, businesses, research institutions and a range of other organisations to highlight the value of their trees. Um, 
we've collaborated in over 30 projects in the UK and abroad, including the UK pilot of iTree, which took place in Torbay in 2010. So um, we've also produced some reports valuing London's urban forest and have worked with Highways England to develop tools for the cost benefit analysis of their natural capital. Um, and in terms of the IG Canopy tool that we're going to talk about today, it is uh, designed to be a sort of on the fly tool. Um, it was developed in the US by the IG Tools team and is part of a whole suite of other tools. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of say it's, it's with a big thank you to all the partners on the screen, including the Woodland Trust, that we were able to fund the adaptation of the tool to, to make it usable really in the UK. Um, and it's been fantastic to have that now up and running for the UK and Sweden. Uh, it was only finalised in, in 2020, so it's been a really exciting year and we've already started working with uh, a range of different clients to survey their tree canopy cover and estimate the benefits. So what I'm going to do today is do a bit of a run through of how to use the tool, the different functions you'll need to go through and hopefully break it down into some nice sizable steps um, to make it really nice and easy to follow. It's a lovely tool to use. There's a couple of setup options that we need to decide on. Then after that, you're straight into the survey. So hopefully you enjoy it. Um, I thought it would be helpful as well to just kind of give you an idea of what, what you might want to use the IG Canopy tool to do. Um, so you can use it to understand how much canopy cover you have in a given area. You can begin to understand and compare sort of the evenness of canopy. So looking for areas where perhaps you've got lots and lots of canopy cover and areas where there's perhaps a lower level of canopy cover that could be increased through tree planting. So it's really helpful for looking at distribution um, across an area. But also you can use iTree Canopy to understand the impact of tree cover on the local environment and on communities. So it's quite an exciting uh, programme and it's fantastic that it's completely open source and is available for anyone to use. Um, there are many, many well-known benefits of trees and I'm not going to spend very long on this. Um, many of the well-known ones are trees' ability to capture and store carbon, improve air quality, uh, provide shade during the summer but there are many many ones that are not so well known such as um, trees have been shown to increase property and rental value to increase uh, footfall along high streets encourage outdoor recreation and sustainable transport options um, and even reduce flooding so using this iTree canopy tool you'll be able to work out the percentage of canopy cover across a given area from a local authority down to maybe your local park there's a massive uh, variation of scale that you can use and then you'll be able to quantify in terms of the amount so in kilograms but also the value so in in pounds how much is that service worth that those trees provide um, for carbon storage carbon sequestration pollution removal and avoided runoff which is sort of flood prevention so um i thought it would help to break it down into kind of three distinct stages um so we've got the project set up the survey and the results um i'm probably going to spend about five minutes on each of those sections uh slightly longer on the beginning two and slightly less on the third one but i'll let you know when we've got to the end of each stage just so you're aware of how far we are through the process so if you're following along now or if you're following along later, when you first open the link, uh, this will be the welcome or home screen. And uh, the first thing we need to do is press the big green button, uh, big blue button, sorry, that says get started. And you'll see it next to the big green arrow on my screen. Um, as we go through, I've sort of used these big green arrows to really highlight which button it is I'm referring to just to make it really clear and hopefully easy to follow. So um, on this next screen, we're going to start the very first stage. So this is stage one. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to tell the tool that everything inside this certain boundary is what we want to survey. Everything outside is, is not included. So there are three uh, different options for how you can do this. And we're just going to talk through those very quickly. So the first one is the top arrow that you can see, which is pointing to the UK boundaries option. Uh, this is fantastic if you want to survey a whole local authority and it's very simple to use. Um, what you need to do is just press the little blue drop down menu and then um, follow the steps. And I'm going to do that in my example in just a moment. The second option is probably most useful if you would like to study 
uh, your ward area, so the area that you live in, um, and you'll need to load the shapefile boundary. Now, I'm not going to talk about that one now because that's part of, um, it's also explained in Kieran's presentation in a moment, so I'm going to leave that one rather than us going through it twice. Um, and the final one is if you want to survey sort of an individual park or perhaps the street that you live on, the road that you live on, I'd probably suggest using the draw boundary function. Um, it's a really handy tool, it's quite simple to use. You just need to sort of put one click down for your first point. Um, every time you want to land a point, add another click. And when you've got all the way around the place that you'd like to survey, just double click and it will complete the boundary. So for this example that I'm gonna to do today, I've chosen to do the local authority of Exeter. So I clicked on the drop down menu on UK boundaries and you probably won't be able to see it very clearly on here, but just a little tip, there's a little icon for an eye with a line going diagonally through it. If you click that, suddenly you'll see the UK will light up blue and that's all the little boundaries loading in the background. So um, if you zoom in and find the one that you're after, as I said, I'm gonna do Exeter and I've just literally just clicked in the middle of the boundary and it's highlighted it in red. So essentially we said to Ida Canopy, Everything that's highlighted in red will be included in the survey, so you can put points anywhere in that area, everything outside of that is not included. Um, and as soon as you've got your boundary set up and you can see it highlighted, you just press the blue next button and that's the first part of that stage all done. So um, we're now going to go on and kind of decide what we want to survey um, in this one that you're going to do. So I probably suggest for the first one having a go at using the two preset options that you can see up here at the top. So there's tree and non-tree and then there's basic land cover. Um, the difference is the tree non-tree is very nice for your first survey. It will give you the canopy cover information that you need and essentially every time you get a survey point pop up you just need to say yes it's a tree or no it's not and you don't need to worry about what it is you can just say it's not a tree if you would like to get a bit more of an understanding about the ground cover so um, whether you, the space is perhaps a, a area of grass so perhaps it could be used for tree planting or perhaps you might want to look at areas that are covered with impervious surfaces so surfaces that water cannot infiltrate, such as tarmac on roads or buildings, you could paint, maybe have a go at the basic land cover options. Um, it's really simple to change those. You can do any of those categories or you can add them, remove them, edit them. You just need to double click on the row below and it will bring up a little menu like this. So you can change the name, you can add a description, change the color, um, whatever it makes it easier for you to run your survey. But as I say, I think for the first one, I'd suggest either going for tree or not tree or the basic land cover options. Um, and I've chosen to do the basic land cover option just because I can go through a few more examples with you. So, um, that's just an example of when you change the options uh, in the menu. So as soon as you've got your um, different categories selected and don't worry, because once you're in the survey and once we've gone through the process, this will probably make a lot more sense. <laughs> um, so once you're ready and you've decided what you want to survey, you're gonna press that blue button that says next, next to my big green arrow. And we're gonna go on to the uh, the final stage, which is to kind of um, tell the program where in the world your survey is taking place, and that helps it to apply the most useful weather data. Obviously, the weather in the UK is very different to weather in the US, and you know even in the UK, the weather you know down south is very different to up north. So, by putting in the um, the sort of region of the country that your survey is taking place, it means that ITRI can find a close weather station um, and apply that. So um, for mine, obviously, is going to be the southwest. So um, this is the little menu on the left. So I've just pressed the drop down menu for United Kingdom, then the same for England and just tick the box for southwest. So that will now find the nearest weather station to the southwest of England. And then we're just going to change these two options because the default is still US dollars and the units are still in English, um, which is not very helpful for us in the UK. So if you just press the drop down next to the big green arrow on the left, it will bring up a menu um, and you can choose Great British Pounds from that list and it should automatically change the, the symbol for you. 
And then the same on the right, if you just click the drop down, it will bring up a menu and you can choose metric. So um, as you do that, you should see the costs at the bottom. So in that very bottom row, you should see those automatically changing to pounds and also to metric and also to your new location. So you might see a little loading circle. Um, that's a good sign. And if it doesn't do that, it might be worth just refreshing just to make sure it has applied the most recent values. But once you're happy and set up, um, and unless you want to go into more detail here, you press next. What I'm going to say is I'm not going to go into detail today, but the costs that are automatically applied in iTree are average costs, which mean that the tool can run on the fly. It doesn't have massive, massive amounts of data in the background. But if you want to try and get to um, a much more precise value, you can find these on the UK government website or water company websites. Um, so if you're really interested, you want to get slightly more precise results further down the line, um, do let us know. But, um, but for now, that, that's great. So we're going to press next and move on to the second stage, which is exciting. So we're now on to the survey, the actual survey itself. Um, you'll hopefully see, and, and don't worry if you can't, on the screen, the little area that I've highlighted, there's a very thin red line going around it. And on your screen, if you're doing the same, you should see your boundary line um, appear. Uh, the first thing we need to do is add our first survey point. So um, next to my big green arrow, there's a plus button. So you just press that one uh, and it should bring you up your first survey screen. It will look a little bit like this. So you've got a large satellite image on your left. And then on the right, there's your um, the different category options that we're going to select. Um, it's really lovely the way it's been set up because you've got the bar chart above and there's sort of a little ticker tape that goes across. So as you do more and more surveying, it will change and it will update automatically, um, which is really, really helpful. Now, sometimes the little um, cross that you need to survey, it can be quite tricky to see, especially because it's yellow on green. So I just tend to zoom in and find it. It's usually in the very centre of the screen. Um, this one's lovely residential area and we're going to use this as our first example plot. Um, so if you see, I've zoomed right in, it's a little bit blurry, but you can hopefully see the yellow cross now really well. Um, so this one's landed in somebody's back garden, it looks like. Um, so for this first point, uh, it's definitely not a tree. So if you're doing tree and not tree, that's really simple. It's just classified as not tree. And if you're doing basic land cover, um, on the menu on the right hand side, you just need to click the little drop down where it says cover class and select the appropriate one. So for this one, as you can see on the right hand arrow, I've selected grass um, and then that's fine. And once you've done that, you press the green button at the bottom that says save and create new and it will automatically take you onto your next uh, survey point. So we're gonna keep doing this survey for for a little while um, and we'll keep doing the process until we reach the number of points that we need to complete the survey and I'm going to talk about that in a moment so just for now just bear in mind we're going to keep surveying for a little while and I'm going to run through it just a couple of examples so this second one here is is quite an exciting one so as you can see it's landed right in the middle of the river X that runs through Exeter city centre um, I'll zoom in so you can see that one. So it's really clear, it's right in the water. So the category that we would apply to that one is water. Of course, if you're doing tree and not tree, it's really easy, it's just not tree. Um, so I thought that would be quite a nice one. You'll get a whole range of different things crop up as you go through the survey. Um, so this next one that we've got here has landed on a rooftop actually of someone's house. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so you can see it. Um, so this one would be classed as building, so you just need to do that on the drop down menu. Um, now I've included this point um, because from a zoomed out perspective it looks like, ah oh, brilliant, it's landed on a tree. Um, and it almost has, very very almost. Um, now if you zoom in a little bit you can see hopefully quite clearly that um, that point's actually landed on the tarmac below the tree and it's a shadow that's sort of cast around the tree. And I just wanted to flag this one up because it, I find it happens quite often when I'm doing the survey. So if you get a, a point that lands on tree cover, I always just zoom in just quickly to just double check it is actually on the tree cover and not on the shadow. Sometimes they're really clear like this one, sometimes they're a bit more tricky. So 
I just wanted to highlight that because I'm sure you'll definitely come across some of those. Um, and then this one is just a really lovely, a lovely point here. As you can see, um, it's landed right in the centre of lovely woodland area. Um, the yellow cross has landed right in the middle. Um, you can see it there next to my green arrow. So we classify this one as tree or shrub, and that's on both of those systems. So if you're doing tree and not tree, it would be tree. And the same if you're on land cover type, it would be um, tree again. Now, um, sometimes when you're doing the survey, uh, the point, the little cross, uh, it might land on almost two categories. So you might find that half of the cross is kind of on some grass and maybe the other half is on a tree or shrub. And what I would say in that scenario is um, choose the one that, it, that represents most of the area. So the one that's more than 50%, just choose the one that's slightly more dominant um, in that situation. Now, um, what we're going to do now is talk about the very final stage of um, step two or, or how to know when to stop. So keep, keep surveying. Um, I will warn you, it's quite addictive once you start going. <laughs> you, you can't stop for a little while. It's, it's quite addictive, but it's really, really fascinating and really good fun. Um, so we have two criteria that we tend to say. So keep surveying either until you reach a standard error of 1.5. So that helps to know how accurate the, um, the survey is. So for example, at the moment, I've surveyed 14 little crosses across a whole city. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine that's not really gonna build up a very big, pic very good picture. It's not very accurate. Um, so I'm gonna need to do quite a lot more points until that's got to a level where actually I could trust the results and, and think that's a fair representation of the city. Um, so standard error, as I say, is, is sort of the, the level of accuracy. Um, however, if you, we sort of say 1.5% or 1,000 points. So if you don't hit 1.5, but you hit 1,000, it's okay to stop there. So kind of whichever one comes first, really. Um, it's rare that you'll probably get to 1,000 points, but it's just to let you know that that's kind of the, the methodology that we use at Treeconomics. So, um, and it's quite easy to... Um, to track your standard error so if you can see it I think it's quite small writing but um, yeah on your screen across above where it says report a big blue button the the values will keep going across like a little ticker tape um, and you can see on the screen at the moment I'll just read it out so it says tree 38.5 percent so that's the amount of tree cover that it has currently been included in this survey and then it says plus or minus 17.2 so that's my standard error so it's way 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 too high um, and I need to do quite a lot more points until we'd be at sort of an acceptable level um, but if you find that tricky to read on the screen that's absolutely fine if you press the report button um, it's that big blue button on the right at the top um, it will take you down to the next screen and we're going to talk a little bit about the report page and everything that is on that in the next slide. So um, the first uh, portion of that report page is all about your tree canopy cover. Um, so you'll see the bar chart has got at the moment, this is a tree and not tree survey. So I've got lots more areas that have been classified as not tree. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, my map, which has got my 14 little points in it. Um, and you can see it's not a very good coverage of the city yet, so I need to do a lot more surveying there. Um, but um, if you look on the sort of right hand side, it will give you the percentage of tree cover, plus or minus, and it says SE, which is your standard error. Um, and then you'll also see on the right the area, so it will tell you the percentage and also the size of the area that your trees make up. Um, just also to let you know, you can view and you can edit all of your points at any, any stage in the process. Um, you can go onto the report tab whenever you want to and then go back to your survey. It's a constantly updating uh, system, so you can flip between the two very easily. Um, the second stage of the of the report is your tree benefits. So you've got um, at the top in the white table is your carbon sequestration and carbon storage. Uh, so that gives you the, the amount, so the quantity in, in, a, in a weight, but it'll also give you a value in pounds. So you can actually state, you know, I don't know, the trees in Exeter uh, store four million pounds worth of carbon every, you know, 
every year. I suppose that's sequestration really, but um, you can put a, a monetary value to that resource um, and, it, and it's an estimation based on the amount of canopy cover that we've um, tracked in our survey. Then the second box is the yellow and white stripy table, which is your air pollution removal. Um, it's quite nice because it breaks it down into uh, the individual pollutants. The one that's most commonly sort of or most commonly talked about in the UK is PM 2.5 because of the impacts on um, on health. Um, but you can also use as a there's a total at the bottom. So that's also if you want to look at your pollution removal. And then finally at the bottom. In the blue and white stripe table is the um, hydrological benefits. So that's the benefits which um, are closely related to reduced flooding. And we use the avoided runoff category mostly when we're reporting at Tree Economics. So you can see the amount in, in litres and also again, the value in Great British pounds. Um, so that's kind of, the little tutorial in a nutshell. Um, but what I really wanted to say is when you get to the end, um, it's really nice to take a look at other studies for similar areas. So it might be uh, towns of a similar size or a similar makeup um, and just see how, you, how they compare and just get a feel for what does 15% canopy cover actually mean? What does that represent? What does it look like? Um, and there's some really great places that you can go uh, to look at other canopy projects. You could go to the Tree Economics website and have a look at our projects or resources tab. Um, and also the web map that Forest Research have been developing that Kieran's going to talk about in just a moment. And also just to say, you know, please share your results because um, it's so lovely that we've got people that are interested and hopefully going to start using IG Canopy. So share them with your friends, with, you know, parish councillors, with town councillors, uh, with your tree group. Um, it's really good to talk about these things and, and share your experiences. So um, that's kind of the end of, of my section. So thank you very much. Um, I'll hand back to Adam and feel free to ask any questions in a moment. Thank you so much, Danny. Yeah, we've got lots of questions coming in and we'll, we've got some time to go through all those at the end. Um, I think the one thing I wanted to sort of say before I pass to Kieran is you might be sitting there thinking, how long is this going to take? Um, so as a guide, I did one for one of my, my one of the council wards near me earlier using the, the project that Kieran's about to demonstrate and talk about. And it took about an hour to get to the, the kind of... Um, threshold in terms of having confidence in the results and having plotted enough points and I got up to about 400 points there um, and so you know that kind of gives you a sense that this is something although we're talking about big numbers of sort of points actually it's a very quick thing to do and it um, I mean we've got a question about the how are the points generate they're randomly generated and they come yeah. one after the other so you get a screen another screen another screen another screen it's actually quite hypnotic when you get into it <laughs> um and yeah so I did one today and it took me yeah about an hour roughly and that included a bit of kind of faffing around at the start um so this is not something that's going to take you days to do you know it's something that's you know relatively quick it will depend on the size of area you're doing a bit um the one question Danny that I thought it might be good for you to just field now before we pass to Kieran is yeah. somebody who's asked about the demonstration of how to hand draw the boundaries now I know that we're not we're not you're using slides because um, <laughs> it reduces the chance of anything going wrong when you're trying yeah. to demonstrate something with a live website to a big audience. But is there anything you could say that might be helpful in terms of guidance on drawing? You know, we talked about the preset boundaries for things like council wards. Kieran, we'll talk about that in a sec. But if you want to find out about the canopy cover level of your local neighbourhood or your park, you'd want to draw the boundary for that. Mm -hmm. So is there anything you could say on that before we move yeah. on? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And actually, in many ways, if it's your first time, I'd almost say to use that option. It's quite intuitive. Um, you just click on the draw boundary option. You'll cut, it'll come up with like a little square and you just drop the, you essentially just click on the screen at the wherever you want to start your boundary from. Keep clicking all the way around. So if you've got a curve, if you do lots more clicks, it, it makes it actually really nice, um, nicely shaped. So you can trace very easily the edge of a, a boundary and you just keep going and following whatever 
line you've got so if it's a park it might be that you've got trees surrounding the edge or if it's I don't know a farmer's field is probably quite a nice one to visualize you've got usually hedgerows going around it so that's quite a distinct thing that you can follow um, and then when you get to the end you just double click and it will it will link it all up nicely for you and it will be like da da here's your boundary and it's and it's preset I I did think about doing a demo but I think actually if you if you have a go on it I think it'll be fine if anyone has any big problems then do send us an email but um it is just click 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 and then just double click at the end and it'll just uh hey presto do it for you fab thank you Danny <laughs> so over to you Kieran brilliant thanks so much um Firstly, thank you to Tree Economics and thank you to the Woodland Trust for the invitation to come and share with you this evening. And so also my thanks to all of you who've uh, joined us uh, to listen in. Danny, really great introduction uh, and thanks for that. To those of you, I've done a couple of little really quick answers to some of the questions that raised. Well, they were really quick and I could type quickly. I, I've just done that for you as we've gone along. Some of the others are a bit more dis, uh, chatty, need a bit more of a chat answer. We'll capture at the end for you. So my name's Kieran Doig. I work for Forest Research. Forest Research is the research agency of the Forestry Commission, and we're a world-renowned organisation for our tree and forest research. I head up the Urban Forest Research Group, and we work to understand the UK's urban forests and the value and the benefits they provide to society. So if we can move on to the next slide, please, Danny. Um, what I've come along to do tonight is to talk to you about one particular project that we started within the group uh, last year. It's going really well as a project, it's developing nicely. Uh, Trees for Cities and Brillianto have been partners with us from the beginning, but I'm so excited that the Woodland Trust uh, and, and you also have come along to listen tonight to, to join in this venture, because as you'll see from the data I share, we're making really good progress. And I just think if we can see this web map, this map of canopy cover across the whole of the UK, if you see that polished off in the next few months, be a really important baseline from which we can have some really powerful impact on those who look after our trees across our towns and cities and, and even across our countryside. So that's really what I want to do now. Uh, if we move on, please, Danny. Um, we want to understand canopy cover at a lower spatial level than we already do. There's some really good statistics out there about how much trees in there are in forests and woodlands. About 3 million hectares is, is the national figure. And of that is about another quarter, in other words, 0.75 million hectares of tree cover outside of woodlands. There's some really good data about how that maps at the regional level. That's the table you've got on screen for you there. And, and, and I think what's really interesting, if you look at the column on the far right hand side, that shows you the error estimate, the, the, the estimate of how much variation or how much error there is in, in that data itself. And as you see there, certainly for the Scottish figures, the, the values are quite high. In other words, we don't have as much confidence in those figures as really perhaps we would like to and actually to use those figures to their fullest. A couple of years back, my group led a project to map canopy cover and we did 283 um, towns and cities of England. We did the seven major uh, cities of Scotland and we, and we did the, uh, the capital city of Cardiff as well. Um, it was kind of a kickstarter to where we are today. It led us to think about how canopy cover varied within our urban environments across England. But it was only the total canopy cover as a single estimate for that town or city. It, it was a city-wide value. It didn't tell us about how that canopy cover varied within the town. Um, and it also, you know, 283 is a good number, but it still didn't cover the whole of the country. So it limited us on, on the sort of range of analyses, considerations, debates we can have about how canopy cover varies across our country and, and, and whether or not distribution is even within our cities. We often hear that it's canopy cover could be lower in areas where um, there's more deprivation, but just how true is that across the whole of the country? Uh, let's move on, please, Danny. So this is the map as it uh, currently stands. Um, you see that actually down in the bottom left, the southwest and parts of Wales, it's really beginning to fill up. And I'm going to explain the map a bit more as we go through. But let me just tell you, those 283 towns and cities that we did cost around £10,000 to survey 
using a dedicated um, researcher time. So just how imagine how much money it was going to cost if we did all 5,000 urban wards. It's a lot of time and a lot of money. And that's why we've called upon you, our citizen scientists, our, our willing volunteers, to, to get involved and um, to get the statistics that are really going to help make a change, but also actually to help you find out what's going on locally. And uh, let's take the next slide, please, Danny. I think Danny has done a fantastic introduction. Uh, I'm sure you're all agree she's really covered the points, but I can imagine some of you have also got a little bit scared about, oh, there's a lot to remember. But don't worry. There is uh, lots of resources out there to help you. iTree Canopy do their own guide. We've done our own 25 page step by step guide. Uh, the links will be shared with you later. And um, it really is a photographic guide. So it'll take you through each of the steps that Danny's done. Um, Slightly nuanced, nuanced to our project, but you'll you'll relate to them and you'll understand them very well, having listened to the to the webinar so far. There's also a, a tutorial, an online video. This was developed or, or created for us by one of our volunteers. They thought actually that the pictorial guide, great as it is, be so much easier to digest if you could watch it. So a 14 minute video that's up there as well. And again, those links will be shared with you. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. OK, so how do you get involved? Now, Danny talked to you about the preloaded um, wards and also we had that question about defining your own study area. But what we'd like to do, what I invite you to do, please, to partake in this project where we are studying electoral wards, because these are really meaningful at the local decision making level. What we needed to do to facilitate you, our citizen scientists, get involved is we needed to make it easy for you to get the shape file that you needed to describe the electoral ward of interest. And so we created this web map. That's what we call it. It's a map on the web. It's a web map, and we fill it in by completing our eye tree canopy assessments for each ward. You let us know what the result is. We fill in the map, and then the whole of the UK will slowly get covered. Um, I'll tell you what the colours mean in a minute as we scroll in a bit further, but if we just um, take the next slide, please, Danny. Uh, and again, just to let you know, those links that are on the bottom of the page will be shared later. So what, what we do is from this home page for the web map, on the top right hand corner, you can see there it says uh, find location or enter address. Type in the location you want um, and it zooms in a bit closer to your area of interest. On the left hand side, the um, bars there show you some summary statistics. First of all, it tells you how many wards within this selected area of the map have been completed, it tells you the average canopy cover for those wards that have been assessed on screen, and also there's a legend on the left hand side. So basically the darker the green, the more canopy cover in that ward. If there's a ward there that's grey, it's still to be assessed, and those really are the ones I want you to focus on for me, please. Um, if you see a yellow one, and you've seen, you would have seen some of the yellow ones on our previous slides, they are ones that people have booked out and they are going to um, be surveying. So you don't need to worry about those, but actually um, you are welcome to do what others have done because that helps us have if you like a quality control, a check on how everyone's doing. So that's all we need from here. Um, zoom into the location, choose the ward that you want to do. Uh, next slide, please, Danny. Click on the ward you want to do, and it comes up with this drop down box. I'm not going to describe it all in detail. There's really no need to tonight. It's in the step by step guide. But essentially, what this part does is it books that ward out to you. And really importantly, the fourth um, box down, it says click here to download the shape file. Um, by clicking that, it downloads it from our web map into your download folder on your computer. And then you carry on really where Danny was introducing. So you remember step two. Right at the beginning there, it says upload a shape file. Well, you now have the shape file that you need. That's all I wanted to share here. If we move on, please, Danny. Um, yes, so <laughs> of course, here it is. And it's um, it's just on the left-hand side. You can see where it says UK boundaries. The box underneath says load shape file. That slide was there just as a prompt to remind us where that goes. Thank you, Danny. Let's move on. Um, so that's that's the project so far. That's really how to get involved, where to get your shape files. Danny's taking you through the process, but I thought what might be nice to share with you is a bit of a, a bit of the statistics. How are we getting on? Why would you get involved? So Northern Ireland, 
Um, we've only recently seen any uptake over there. So actually, we don't have any of the rural rewards assessed in Northern Ireland just yet, and only 12% of the rural, of, sorry, of the urban wards. But look at our row there for Scotland. We're nearly done. 98% of the urban wards of Scotland have been assessed. And, you know, if we're not done in Scotland by Christmas, oh, oh well, I should eat my hat, shouldn't I? Um, and Wales, um, when we saw the map just now, you probably remember the, the, the map had really been filled up. It's, there's a, like a, a sweep of progress from the southwest through Wales round into England. Wales is doing really well, both on the urban and rural front. And actually, the urban wards are slightly behind. We're about 50, nearly 60 percent complete there. We're doing really well in England, 77% of the wards complete. So I'm really optimistic that with your help, we will get this done. Just to re-emphasize though, you know, 5,000, it's just short of 5,500 wards in total. We've done about 4,000 now, so 1,500 between the rest of us. I'm sure we can get this done in a couple of months. Um, I've missed the obvious stuff though, haven't I? What's the average canopy cover? About 16% comes up time and time again. You'll see there is the average canopy cover of the towns and cities of, or, or of those wards that have been assessed so far. But look, the range ranges from 0%. I mean, it was actually half a percent, but I've rounded it off here, all the way up to 80% canopy cover in one electoral ward. And just think how powerful this can be if you can flag this to your local decision makers to say, look, my ward is way below the average or way behind the other wards that are surrounded. Uh, the route that around me. So last slide, I think, Danny, please. Um, sorry, it's penultimate slide. Just showing you a little bit more up close what it looks like when you zoom into the map. You see here um, the, that area of on the left hand side around Bath. Some of the wards have got much darker canopy cover, and yet they they have wards right next to them where canopy cover is really. Um, nowhere near as as, um, as higher value. So it's, it's really important that we understand the variability across our towns and cities so that we can start to address the, the differences here. And again, this slide shows, shows you some wards here that have been booked out and hence they colour yellow. Please focus on these grey ones and we'll get it done. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, and final slide, which is where I, I must say thank you to all the partners who've joined us in the project so far and I'm really happy to to be here tonight and take questions as we move on. Back to yourself Adam. Fabulous, thank you so much Kieran for that tour around the project. Um, so we're going to come into some questions now so I've been making a note of a few but before we maybe bring Danny back in Kieran I had a question for you which is perhaps the obvious question about which city or town has the highest level of canopy cover or perhaps the lowest as well well when we did um it's really important to state here actually that when you try and compare these things you want to make sure you've got complete data sets so that you're complete you're comparing a whole with a whole you know an apple with a, an apple not an apple with a pear so i'm not going to refer to my data here from the web map i'm going to refer to the study we did a couple of years back and farnham in surrey had the highest canopy cover of the towns and cities assessed um, and and there was, oh, what was it called? Up on the northwest coast, down at about 3%. Um, I can help you. It's Fleetwood, I think. Karen. There we go. Down with F, Fleetwood. Yeah. I, maybe I didn't want to name them and shame them. But yeah, I, so a big, broad range, 3% all the way up to 43% at the city level. But I think what, what this current study has shown is actually, if you drill down further, what a range we can see. And, and that's... I think that's where the real stories begin to open up. Yeah, fantastic. I suppose in the case of something like Fleetwood, it's a coastal climate as well. So the, it's going to be quite different, really, in terms of the sort of treescape you might have somewhere like Farnham. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, we part of the UK. We did actually find that generally Canopy Cover was about 5% less in coastal towns and cities, but only 5%, not that whole 45%. So, you know, no excuse really. I'm sure they can manage a little bit more. I think you made a really good point there at the end in terms of I think the data gives you a really good why in terms of almost any tree based activity really whether you're trying to protect existing trees or you're trying to plant more you know understanding levels of canopy cover and then the values that those trees provide it's kind of almost essential context really for putting your own activity in that bigger picture 
and I think any kind of conversation you want to have with local councillors, MPs about trees, this is the kind of evidence base that's going to help us to make a convincing case for why we need to protect the trees we've got and plant more. So let's do again some questions. So I think first, if we have perhaps Danny on, on the map, well, in fact, both of you just, just chip in and answer, but perhaps Danny on, on the maps. So a question about the sort of base maps here. So is it Google Maps or what, you know, what, what's the map that's being used? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's Google Maps. And I've noticed a few people have asked about the date of the mapping. I think it varies a lot as with Google Maps itself does when you're searching for directions or what have you. I think some uh, data sets are newer than others. Um, and I, there is that's what's built into the tool. So it, that is just what's there. Um, but some of them, yeah, some of them are more recent than others. Um, I think that's probably all I can say on that, really. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. I would just chip in to say it's slightly frustrating that Google Maps puts a copyright date on it. Yes. <laughs> Um, the only real way to find out is to go into Google Earth and to back scroll through time until you get the comparable image. It perhaps is the biggest limitation of the study at the moment, but it, by doing our baseline within a fixed period of time, we can then cut it off and we can, we can put that on the shelf for analysis and then we can move on to the emergent technologies to make future comparisons. But at the moment, we don't have this. And I think any data that's known, you know, it's captured that time frame is going to be a huge leap forward in comparison to what we have. Okay then, so just another question on the maps then um, to either of you. It's a question about how this compares to information on the national tree map or other LIDAR derived data on tree cover. So is there anything that we could say on that? I'm happy to take that on if you like Danny. Yeah, well, again in our previous work um which was a catalyst to this work we did some direct comparisons and we found that within the statistical boundaries of both techniques they are robust they stand up with each other and we've done that time and time again we've done multiple cities we've used multiple people assessing we've got that confidence that these technologies do work uh, and i think that's why it's important as adam and danny said earlier to keep going with the numbers of points so that you the error estimate that you get when you do your ward or your area is a nice tight error estimate and no technique is going to give you the perfect answer there's always going to be an error estimate and we're going to have to work with that as we begin to change in canopy cover uh, wherever we are yeah and I, I mean i can't stress enough that, that i know the numbers sound daunting in terms of hundreds of points and things but they really don't take long when once you get into it and the system does it all for you, you know you click your button your plus symbol and there's another one for you to look at and often so in the case so i live in a um in the east midlands in a relatively tree deprived part of the country so the canopy cover for my local ward is about 10 percent, so it's down at the very lower end and the vast majority of plots for me are, are arable fields, actually. You do get the odd patch of ancient woodland or, or villages. So it really doesn't take long. It's very obvious it's not a tree. And, and in the, the project that Kieran's using, it's really you're just saying, is it a tree or not? It doesn't use the land cover um, yeah. things that uh, Danny de demonstrated to us as well. So, you know, although we're talking about lots of plots, it really doesn't take long. So I think, Danny, a question on the benefits then. So we've had does the benefits only refer to kind of carbon sequestration? Um, so you do, I think you mentioned maybe a little bit at the beginning about some of the other ones, but maybe just to recap, you know, what, you know, when we're talking about the value of trees, which is what iTree Canopy is helping us to understand, you know, what evidence are we getting that we could use? Yeah, that's a really nice question. And actually, before I go into that, I was kind of going to say that there are a lot of benefits and that's partly why I wanted to include that slide that, that we can't quantify yet just because there aren't scientific methodologies there but we know they're there we know they have an impact we know they have a benefit um, and iTree is fantastic because it gives us a way of actually being able to quantify some of those and the ones that it does allow you to quantify are the carbon storage the carbon sequestration annually so it's every single year um, the pollution removal and avoided runoff, which is um, essentially in, in a nutshell, um, when it rains on a tree, some of that water is held within the canopy and then re-evaporated. So that water that, that is within the tree canopy doesn't enter combined sewage systems and doesn't contribute to surface water, which then leads in some cases to flooding. So um, that's sort of the relevance between that one. So there's some really key um, challenges that a lot of cities are trying to work towards 
alleviating and trying to to minimize and actually all the while your trees are standing there doing a, a fantastic job of, of removing and, and helping some of those things so those are the four that you're able to quantify um, using iTree so hopefully that gives a good picture. Thanks Danny yeah and I think it's that point isn't it about it enables you to understand the value of trees and I think you know anyone who's attending this webinar who's trying to either plant trees or protect them or do pretty much anything for trees in a local community is such a huge part of it is trying to communicate the value of those trees and you know there's a few ways of doing that you know we have things like CAVAT now as a, a way of calculating the amenity value which is a sort of methodology for doing that but I think iTree Canopy opens up a whole world of possibilities in terms oh. of the evidence you can get for free now because this is an open source yeah. tool <laughs> for free which is fantastic so yeah. You know, it's not something you have to pay a consultant to produce a report on. This is something you can go away and do yourself. Um, so, OK, so I think a couple of questions then about the actual sort of process, um, which perhaps weren't picked up in your um, your very good demonstration, Danny. So the, and these are like the awkward questions about yeah, that's what fine, you do if this happens. <laughs> so what happens if the cross that the system gives you lands on a tree that has no canopy? So that would be, for example, a pollarded tree. Okay. Or perhaps, I mean, uh, presumably some of the imagery is from the winter as well, where you might not have um, the leaves on the tree. So is there any advice you could give people on what to do in those scenarios? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I think I, my argument would probably be if it's a tree, it goes down as a tree. Um, mm. So if it's in so pollarded, it, even if it's not currently got leaf on it, it will still be providing benefits. Um, and eventually the leaves will obviously grow over the season and again with winter trees um, even though there are no leaves if, if you come across a winter uh, image of a, a tree in winter um, it's still a tree it's still providing benefits um, so I would say if it's a tree it goes as a tree <laughs> yeah yeah if you look at national statistics on woodlands woodlands are woodlands all year round you know whether it's summer or winter so I completely agree Danny <laughs> yeah it's a good question though because actually you know, when you think about it I can yeah I think that's a really good question um yeah okay and then an, another one about overhanging branches so if you if the cross lands on a, a branch that's overhanging let's say a parked car on the driveway what would you do in that scenario that's another tricky one um my default is usually to consider what's on the ground so I tend to try and do it with with that i a branch overhanging though like that's a tricky one what would you go with Kieran I was a tree I mean we have to remember we're doing tree a uh, land cover type yeah. mm. so it's, it's a tree covering a, a you know whatever's underneath doesn't matter if it's a road or a river for me yeah. you know it is part of the canopy of the tree we're not doing land use here we're doing yeah. so yeah okay so hopefully that helps to clear that up I mean having done a couple of these myself you know you do free I mean that's an outlier situation but certainly one that could come up yeah. um, you know you do quite often come across things like shadows of trees yeah um, and there's guide you know there's clear guidance on on the um the forest research guidance that Kieran showed us of what to do in those sort of scenarios and also what to do if it lands on a hedge that was something that I found myself wondering quite a lot about all of those sort of questions are answered in the, in the forest research guidance Mm -hmm. I would just can offer we, as a sort of sorry, go Karen. I was just to say, can we say, Adam, please don't cheat. If it's just off the edge of that branch over the over yeah. the, <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. Because when when new technologies take over, we repeat this in a few years' time, and that tree hopefully has grown, then yeah. it will be part of canopy cover. But if we cheat and cover it now, we'll never really understand our trend. So it's you know, pay respect. I think if it's a tree, it's a tree, and if it's not, if it misses, it misses. <laughs> we're citizen I'm science so we won't let you down kieran <laughs> there are okay. definitely points that come up i've had a few where you kind of have to assess it on a site-by-site -site basis and really look at actually what's going on at this point particularly um but yeah there will be some i'm sure some really interesting ones yeah, yeah and i would i would just add a sort of perhaps a tip from my own user experience that there's quite a few steps to do. None of them are that complicated, um, but I, I often have a tab open with the PDF guidance, so I can flick between it and then the you know the actual iTree website. 
and I found that worked really well for me and definitely made the whole thing a lot easier to do so I would recommend that and the you know the step-by-step -step guidance you know it's a 25 25 page pdf because it's full of screenshots it's not because there's like thousands of words that you need to read to do it it's because there's loads of really helpful screenshots that pretty much answer all your questions so you know again don't be daunted by the perhaps some of the numbers and things that you're hearing it really is quite a doable task um so just a a, a question we've got about the timing of the photo photographs here from mary um and mary's asking um because it's using Google Maps, does that mean the images are from different times? So you might have one data point on a map, a photograph that was from one point in time and then another one from another point in time. I guess that's possible, is it, with Google Maps? It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, even if you go, sometimes if you're, if you're on Google Maps and you're looking on Street View, sometimes you go through and it's sunny weather and suddenly you're transported to some awful grey, stormy, cloudy weather so yeah that that will happen um and that's just uh you know that's that's kind of one of the the limitations behind the tool but i don't think it will cause too many problems um in the survey but it's worth you know being aware of that and i think this is you know we're working with the technology we've got right now yeah. at this point in time aren't we and yes. you know it's not i mean you know five years ago it was probably unthinkable that we could do a citizen science project like this with this kind of technology that was but only really being used by tree professionals to manage you know city tree assets and things now it's open to all of us and we can actually do this kind of big citizen science project and um, just so going to end we, up reassurance adam that people i don't think should get too worried about this you know the real strength of a baseline and understanding what you've got is because you've got it yeah. and five years time when you really want to understand if changes happen or not and it does take that long for change to occur We'll have other technologies to to quickly repeat this but if we don't get it now we won't have anything to compare to so mm -hmm. it'll be a 21 22 baseline or a 2020 to 2022 baseline but at least it'll be a baseline and, and that's i think that's a data gap that i really want to drive home to people that i think we're all going to be so much better for having so just a couple of questions then um to to wrap up really so we've got a question here about the measured benefits are they based on american statistics so danny do you want to take that one first yeah that's a really good question um so the original tool was completely is us based it's de it's designed for us systems and then the uk adaptation has been um upgraded so it's got uk costs and values associated with it so uh, the carbon value is related to how the UK government values carbon, which is very different to the US. I'm not going to go into that today because I think our brains are already full, but uh, they use a slightly different way of calculating that. And again, with avoided runoff, that is based on an average from UK water companies and the same for pollution removal, apart from a couple of pollutants which are not valued in the UK. So some of those pollutants aren't seen on or aren't valued by our UK government. So there isn't a, a relevant statistic available. And if you want to look into, you're more than welcome to look into the background workings of calculating the quantities. However, it's it's quite a hardy document. So you're more than welcome. We'd be very happy to share that. It's available on the IT website. Um, um, but I think it's quite complicated if we start going into how those are calculated. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. And Kieran, mm. if there's anything I've missed, feel free to jump Not in. Not at all. Perfect <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm going to, so I think this is a useful question, I think, about um, some of the reports that you can find on both the Forest Research website and the Tree Economics one yeah. about uh, studies of different cities include information on things like tree species. Yes. And that's probably because they're using a different version of iTree that's mm. sort of more advanced. So it might be helpful just to quickly mention that so people understand what that is and the difference between yeah. the systems. No, of course. And um, that's a really, not, a really good question. So as we met, I mentioned it right at the beginning, the iTree Canopy is one of a suite of tools. So there's a number of other ones that you can use in the UK. A lot of them are only used in the US. 
the primary one that's very different is iTree Eco, which is uh, like a proper piece of software that you load onto your computer. So it's not an on online website on the fly tool. Um, it's a lot more complicated. It requires a lot more data. Um, and particularly ones that are talking about species, obviously iTree Canopy can't do anything with species at the moment because it's just looking at it as a almost like a, a, a mass or a, a big chunk. So it's just looking at the coverage from above it's not distinguishing between species so to do that sort of assessment um, you need to be running data that has tree species included so it's already been surveyed on the ground um, that's a really important question because um, yeah it can't be used to derive any species information that's a, a different piece of software thanks danny anything to add kieran no, I mean, quite simply, iTree Eco, we go out in the field, don't we, Danny? And we serve yeah. in the field, and therefore we see what we're looking at. That's a key difference. Uh, time's, time's near the end. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, you know, take the last few questions. Yeah, so so I think what we'll do is we'll try and um, we'll go through the questions afterwards. And I think if there's other ones we think we can helpfully answer uh, by email afterwards, um, then we'll, we'll try and do that. You will get an email from us, um, yeah, if not tomorrow, probably the day after with a link to this, a recording of this webinar. And we'll also include some useful links in there um, onto the things like the Forest Research website. But, you know, you can click around. If you just Google iTree, go to the Tree Economics website, there's a whole host of really great reports and kind of city level studies where you really start to get a good insight into what's going on in terms of urban trees and the, the values and benefits. So before we wrap up in a sec, any final words or, you know, maybe what happens next? You know, we, we're in the middle of trying to build this. So perhaps first from you, Kieran, the map. We're going to hopefully help you complete this map in the next few months. That's what we want to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a researcher. I want to be able to start to interrogate the data and understand what's driving these trends. And if we can't have a complete map, that's really limited in what we can do. So please help us to, to finish this off. And then we can get some more really interesting data and, and answers back out to you to help you drive change on the ground. Thank you. And Danny? I was just going to say have a really wonderful time and I'm sure, I mean, the first time I started looking at IT Canopy in the place that I lived, it was fascinating going, zooming into places that you recognise from walking past them and, you know, I, I think it's amazing to understand a bit more about the trees in the place that you live because they're personal to you um, and, and it kind of, it's funny how you know if it's somewhere that you know you say oh 10 percent, yeah okay I, I know what that feels like I know what that looks like yeah. and that will help you to build up to look at trees in other areas so have a really wonderful time and enjoy using our canopy it's a really nice tool to use and um yeah don't get through. great well look thank you Danny <laughs> thank you Kieran and thank you all for joining us we've really enjoyed all your questions and engagement um so if you're out there helping trees thank you very much <laughs> okay goodbye <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.